Thanks. Uh, thanks for the uh, invitation. It's uh, great to be here and talk a little bit about uh, is there profit in pixels. Basically, we're going to be talking about remote sensing is what we talk about when we talk about pixels um, is remote sensing. Um, so my background, um, yeah, so basically I'm a farmer who's got an interest in remote sensing. Um, I, my Nutfield Scholarship was sponsored by the GRDC. I did that back in 2014 with a, a focus on UAVs and drones. My interest, I, I still keep up to date with what's going on in the whole UAV drone space, but my interest has actually shifted more towards the, the satellite imagery and the work that's going on um, in, in that space. Uh, I find that for broadacre farming, there's, there's a lot more value uh, coming out of the satellite space, out of the satellite technology than there is out of the UAVs. Um, for the moment, that may change. But what is remote sensing? Um, basically, it's, it's collecting information, it's collecting data uh, when you're not actually there to, to touch it, to feel it. So it's collecting from a, a distance which is further away from the point where you're collecting the data from. And generally with uh, satellites or, or drones or anything, uh, you've got a platform and then you mount some sort of sensor on the platform. It could be as simple as a uh, digital camera or it could be some sort of more advanced camera. And what that camera or sensor is doing generally is measuring light reflectance. That's all it is, satellite imagery, anything like that. It's measuring the light that's bouncing back off the object, going through the atmosphere, and then we're measuring how much uh, is actually landing at the sensor after it goes through all the uh, atmosphere and cloud and smoke and all that sort of thing. So that's what um, remote sensing is. But another benefit of it is that you can these sensors can often see things that our human eyes cannot see. So it can see wavelengths that um, our human eyes cannot discern and that allows us to see more information um, that's not available to our own eyes. Um, and when that information is collected, it is of most use to us if we can uh, apply a spatial component to it. So a lat long, to every single pixel that we have, we have a latitude and longitude or some sort of spatial reference uh, for that pixel and that way we can compare it to um, other pixels or other data that's being collected over time and start to build up a repository of information which we can then uh, analyse uh, much more efficiently and accurately if we have a spatial reference for that data. Uh, yeah, so that covers up on that. This is a, a busy slide, but it's basically, I've just pulled a few examples out of um, the, the satellite systems that are up or orbiting the Earth at the moment, and I guess some of the parameters that, that go with them. The, the one down the bottom here, it's, uh, it's uh, just an example of a, a drone. But the two at the top are quite interesting because the um, European Space Agency and NASA provide basically all their data for free to any institution, anyone that wants to go and get it. We can grab it, we can do what we want with it, and then we can sell it to other people. There's no... Um, uh, limitations on, on what we can do with that data, which is great, and it, it allows um, anyone who's interested in having a go at doing anything with, with satellite imagery uh, a starting point, and you can build something on a really robust um, knowledge that that data is just going to keep pouring in year after year from these um, places. And then you move down into the sort of more commercial operations of Planet, Planet Labs, and that's one of these uh, Silicon Valley type startup companies that's actually uh, going really well. I think they've got somewhere around 100 satellites that they've put into orbit. Uh, they're, they're the size of not much bigger than a shoebox. Um, and they plan to be able to capture an image of the entire Earth, stitch it together daily uh, with a resolution of one to five metres. So you can discern the colour type of a car from that imagery over the entire Earth every day. Pretty cool. Um, obviously, because they're a commercial company, they're not going to give that information away for free. There's a charge to it. Uh, and then you, you move up to Digital Globe, which has been around for quite a number of years. Um, generally, their customers are military, um, civil construction, mining, and their imagery is fantastic, but they have to point the sensor on their satellite um, to the thing they want to look at. So basically they need to task when they take a photo or capture an image uh, a day or two in advance, depending on how important you are. You might get the image you want, you might not. If the US government or something, someone more important pays a bit more money to get an image um, at that particular time. And that's more expensive again, but the, the quality is excellent. And now you have 
uh, drones, UAVs, and you have this potential for control over your sensor, control over your platform, control over um, technology as it develops, you go, oh, this sensor's new and changed, instead of worrying about, oh, we, oh it's, in, it's in space, we can't get it back and, you know, update the um, sensor hardware, uh, it's on your drone, so you can just pull out the old one and put the new one in. But there's a lot of challenges around UAVs. Um, I, I've built them and flown them, and, and the, uh, Darren was talking about how they, they all crash all the time. It, that can be an issue, but it's more to do with, to me, the, um, it, it takes manpower to have someone watch a drone in the current regulatory space that we're in. So you, if you're flying a drone and you're catching information, you have to have eyes on it legally, unless you have some really uh, special license from CASA uh, to, to operate that equipment. Uh, and finding someone to do that uh, is difficult, because if you think about the different spaces that we're in, you've got agronomists and farmers who are interested in, in this drone data, but their time is filled up with doing agronomy and farming. They're, and then I guess I suppose there's space for someone to come here and offer, offer it as a consulting service. Um, I considered that a little while ago and, and the, uh, the money was, people weren't prepared to pay for that. So that's where we see that with the, the drone and satellite imagery position. Happy to answer more questions on that one later on if that didn't make sense. So what are the opportunities that, that uh, relate to remote sensing. I'll give one example not relating to ag and the rest will be sort of ag related industries. And one of the interesting ones that I've heard about is in the US you've got a lot of these, well basically around the world but focusing on the US for the minute, uh, really large uh, retail outlets like Walmart uh, and that sort of thing. And by looking at the imagery and counting the cars outside the car parks of these um, different shops you're able to people have been able to accurately forecast what their sales growth or decline is going to be by the number of people that are coming and going from the shops from the satellite imagery. So that's one really interesting application for imagery that's thinking outside the square but is, is really sort of valuable if you're, a, um, uh, if you're trading in publicly listed stocks or something like that and you can get that information before someone else does. Um, so relating to, back to the sort of um, ag and its related industries. We've got forecasters, and I'll cover that an example off on my next slide there. Uh, insurers. Uh, if an insurance claim uh, comes through, it's better for the insurance company, it's better for the farmer, it's better for everyone if you have an accurate um, uh, representation or an accurate measurement of uh, how much damage has been caused by a natural disaster. It's no good. Um, someone trying to overestimate just to get their little bit, bit uh, more out of the insurance company or the insurance company trying to, you know, be as um, tight as possible in, in the handout. If you can, the great thing about natural disasters, there's not a lot of good things about them, but one good thing is that with a, a, um, a hailstorm or a fire or something like that is that we're talking about light reflectance with remote sensing. You look at it before the fire, you look at it afterwards, it's pretty easy to discern from the imagery where that fire has been. Um, if you're thinking about a, um, a wheat crop that's ready to harvest and a fire breaks out, it goes from uh, a nice ripe wheat colour to blackness. Um, so that's one example of insurers. Researchers and uh, governments, so researchers there sort of, uh, I, I see the application for the, for the drones there with their small plot trials, and that's, that sort of thing. Um, there, there's more and more interest, I, I think, the drones will, will be sold to them first before they move to the, the more broad acre ones, which is what's happening. Uh, and now the area where I've got most experience is with the agronomists and the, the farmers. Uh, so the overall the uh, agronomists and farmers want, generally want the same outcomes, but they are actually slightly different. Agronomists have a separate business to the farmers. So they're making money by consulting to the farmers and they need to be, try and be as efficient as possible. So with satellite imagery, it helps them know uh, where to focus their inspections and they can actually cover uh, more ground more quickly by knowing the, the uh, most uh, urgent areas to look at uh, from looking at the imagery. And that's basically uh, one of the key sales points to, to my product and SATAMAP to agronomists is it makes them more efficient with their scouting. Um, obviously, the agronomists want to make the farmers more profitable because uh, without profitable farmers, the consultants don't make any money either. And the farmers, generally, they want to be more productive. So less inputs in uh, and more product coming out. 
So this is going back to the forecasting one, uh, predicting the future. This is really interesting, and um, I haven't heard as much as I thought I would today in the sessions the words machine learning, artificial intelligence, and that sort of thing. But they're the, they're the buzzwords that are coming next, and that people who are reading a lot about it, um, the technology and this big data type thing, that's, that's where the, the value is going to come out of the data, the, or buzzwords and whatever else. But predicting the future, this is really interesting. So from this satellite imagery, from one of these companies that has 100 plus satellites that they've got data to, they're able to um, predict the US corn and soybean crop 1% better than the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, so about the same, given for uh, margin of error, I suppose, 1%. But the interesting about this is, I'm not exactly sure what the uh, USDA do to get all their facts and figures, but I do know that it involves a lot of surveys, uh, it involves a lot of volunteers and a lot of staff on the ground going around and talking to uh, thousands of farmers and that sort of thing, whereas that aspect to uh, this company uh, doing their forecast, it was, it was minimal. Uh, they use, they focus mainly on the imagery and on training their algorithms to look at that satellite imagery and firstly they've got to discern what crops where and then try and pick out what it's going to yield and they were able to do it two years in a row as accurately as the USDA. So, And this is just the beginning. So these satellites haven't to this uh, extent haven't been up there for that long and this is the sort of information they're getting out of it. So in time as computers get more powerful, as people get smarter and combine human intuition and knowledge with the uh, artificial intelligence algorithms, um, these sorts of thing is going to, the next thing that comes out in a couple of years time or in 12 months time will probably surprise us even more. So um, it's a space to watch. Now I'm going to go right back from this, that level onto sort of onto my farm and with the, the agronomists that I deal with, with my Satamap business. So this is sort of like what's right, this is what's happening in Moree with, with satellite imagery, I suppose. Um, I'm going to fo focus on agronomy and, and, and on farm. And the one thing that with us and with ev all farms is variability is complex. You generally have two buckets of variability. You have man-made variability or management variability and then you have natural or environmental variability. Uh, but the, the really complex thing about them is they cross over. They're crossing over all the time. So, so we're creating variability with our different inputs and that sort of thing. But if we vary our inputs over variable soil, that soil will actually respond differently to those variable inputs. And we may be evening things out, or we may be creating more variability again. Very confusing, but it, it, it can be hard to deal with. And basically, with the remote sensing, it gives us this um, bird's eye view of that actual variability. It doesn't tell us whether it's man-made or not, but it tells us that it's there. Uh, this image at the top is collected from a drone on my farm in uh, 2014. It's a bit hard to see, but basically those yellow strips that run down it are uh, where a pre-plant urea um, planter, one wing wasn't putting out the urea at the same rate as the rest, and uh, it was able to be shown up. It showed up very um, obviously on that imagery, but you couldn't see it on the ground. And this bottom one here is a satellite image of a waterlogged chickpea crop. Um, and I'll go into more information on that a little bit later. So I suppose there's, there's two parts to how roughly we, we put satellite imagery to, to work, I guess. One is to help solve problems that exist, and the other one is to try and be more productive. And you think they sort of sound the same and overlap a bit, but I'll show you what I mean. We've, we've got a series of problems on our farm in our area, and a big one is herbicide resistance. Uh, water logging, like I just showed you, the last couple of years we've experienced water logging in our chick chickpeas and, and disease as well. And one thing that most farms have, and you see it, I see it a lot more now that I look at a lot more satellite imagery, is machinery malfunction. Um, and people making mistakes with, with chemicals and that sort of thing. It, it does create problems. Um, so resistant weeds. This is uh, a, what is this? This is a drone image which was collected around the same time that other one was that I showed you in that top corner. And what's been done here is I've taken the data and put it, processed it. It's just a colour image. There's nothing fancy about it. It's what our uh, human eyes can see. And theoretically, we could sit down and look at every single centimetre of that image and, and draw in where 
the uh, ryegrass is growing in between those wheat rows there. Or alternatively, we can train a computer program. We draw in about 10 different training zones and say, this is what soil looks like, this is what uh, wheat plant looks like, this is what ryegrass looks like, and you get it to run, run an algorithm over it with a few different methods, and it, it comes up um, to areas where it estimates that all the ryegrass is in that paddock. And using that information, you've got options then to go, OK, let's apply a higher herbicide rate um, on the areas where we know there's a 90% probability of there being ryegrass. And the reason you'd want to do that is, one, just to save on your input costs. Two, um, I, there's like an environmental sort of aspect to putting out less herbicide. Um, three, a lot of the herbicides that you, well, some of the herbicides that you apply to, especially the group B ones you apply to, um, kill a, a black oak plant or a ryegrass plant can, there is a risk that they can uh, affect the growth of the wheat plant. So you, you really don't want to be putting them out at high rates uh, unless you really have to be. So knowing exactly where the, the weeds are uh, gives you management options there. This is interesting looking at um, glyphosate resistance summer weeds. It's a big problem up in our area. No one denies it anymore and we've accepted it and we're, we're trying to deal with it. So. Uh, our biggest problem weed is probably ornless barnyard grass. And this centre image here is a, uh, from a Sentinel-2 satellite, which each pixel on that represents a 10 by 10 metre area on the ground. And the yellow patches in that grey area are, are weeds, and most of them are the barnyard grass. So uh, when you're looking around a fallow paddock uh, for weeds, they sh the, the big patches of weeds will show up on satellite imagery, so someone who wants to um, go straight to a patch where, where the weeds are, uh, know that if there's misses in the paddock, it's very easy to see them on the satellite imagery. And given that most farms in our area are uh, zero tillage now, that these photos down the bottom aren't a very good representative, but if you grow a five tonne to the hectare uh, wheat crop and the amount of stubble that lets, is left over is phenomenal, it's very hard to see weeds driving around the ute, around the paddock. Uh, without a, um, a perspective looking uh, from above down. Uh, so that's, that's a use for the satellite imagery. And now we move to more waterlogged chickpeas. This is, this is our subject paddock here. And these black uh, lines along here are flow accumulation. And this data um, set is basically a satellite derived um, elevation set which yeah, I got from the Australian government, actually. I just downloaded it, so it was free and available. Great. And I was able to generate flow accumulations, which lets me figure out exactly where all the water's flowing through this paddock. And the interesting thing about this image is these paddocks here that are grey are long fallow paddocks. So they would have a higher moisture stored in them before a large rain event, which means they're going to run water quicker, which means that paddocks that are downstream of a long fallow paddock are going to get a higher proportion of water running off into them uh, which can uh, give you a high risk of a waterlogging event. Um, so when you start to combine different data sets, um, both, both derived from satellites, um, you start to understand what causes this waterlogging event here, which has given us a lower biomass through the centre of this paddock than uh, to the north or to the south. Uh, and we can start to uh, see that it's caused effects through this paddock here too, which is the neighbour's paddock, um, and then down through here as well. A lot of the satellite imagery that we deal with in Satomap is we don't uh, cookie cut paddocks. We often look at uh, whole farms. Uh, even we look at the neighbours' farms. We look at um, benchmarking against other paddocks around the place. And it's, it's a way to give this perspective of you look at your paddock, you zoom out, you look at your farm, you zoom out, you look at your district. It's not just looking you know, internally at this, at this one paddock. Um, from this, it was a fantastic season last year, but some farmers did have large chickpea losses, which were offset by above average yields on the paddocks that we didn't have chickpea losses on. So um, if, if, we were one, if we had one rainfall event less, uh, that chickpea yield that came out of the district would have smashed records phenomenally, like so much more than they did. So um, yeah, it, it was set up to be a really uh, big year, but we did get some losses anyway. Uh, we were calculating, estimating what those losses were going to be before harvest so people could go and organise um, their uh, close-out contracts, talk to their bank manager, that sort of thing, give them a bit of an idea of the areas that have been wiped out, 
we'd just give them a histogram and colour them in and they'd go and ground truth it themselves. We're, we're not giving them hard data on, you know, exactly you're going to get, you know, 900 tonnes off this paddock. It's just a tool for them to, to, to use, to use and, and make their own calculations. Um, the next thing is, is, this is a more traditional thing when you think of um, precision farming. Let's do variable rate yield maps, variable rate gypsum, that sort of thing. Uh, there's a, probably a little bit more than that going on than there used to be, but there's still not a whole lot of that happening up in the Moorie area. Um, this is an interesting one that I like. It's, a, it's another one that's to reduce the um, herbicide application. It's a, the image on the right here, it's a biomass map of a fallow, so there's meant to be nothing, it's a chemical fallow, meant to be nothing in that paddock except the stubble, but the, the um, glyphosate resistant barnyard grass got away in it. And then the following summer, they wanted to try and uh, control it as well as possible. So straight after harvest, they went out with a residual herbicide flame, which is, has really good results in controlling, it's a, uh, controlling all summer grasses. But what they wanted to do was only apply it where they thought they needed it most. So the theory is that where the biomass was highest, that's where seed set would have been greatest. So they applied a, a full label rate on the areas that, that had a higher biomass of that plant over last summer and then a lower, lower rate throughout the rest of the paddock. Um, so that, that, that was an interesting, it wasn't an idea I came up with, it was an idea that the, one of the consultants that uses the satellite imagery I provide came up with. And um, uh, the thing that happened was that it, it's, it's actually more difficult than you think applying a variable rate chemical because you've got to consider your uh, drift, your droplet size, your pressures in your sprayer. So if you, you're changing between zones all the time, you're actually changing your water rate, uh, it affects your um, droplet size and your pressure that you're applying the chemical at. So it's, it's, it's a more technical application than just putting it into the controller and saying change the rate here, change the rate there. You have to change your speed and, and that sort of thing. So. Um, they got it out in the end, just with a really high water rate. This is on my farm, Veribrate Urea. We only do about one, one paddock a year. Um, and this was successful this year because it was a, a paddock that doesn't perform very well down on the bottom of the hill. And when I mean hill, I just sort of mean a gradual slope. But down, down the bottom, it, it usually, it's a lot tighter soil that doesn't break up as well. And up the top, it's more of a cracking clay. We've applied less fertiliser down the bottom and more at the top. And generally, we saved on our inputs, but we pulled out the similar sorts of um, yield to what we normally get. So overall, we lowered our inputs, but kept our outputs the same. Now, I have a little talk about, it says futuristic drone applications, but the technology exists to do this now if you find someone who wants to, to do it for you somewhere. And uh, generally, coming out of the, the mining industry is where you get the most experienced uh, drone operators and processors. A lot of people that are new to the ag industry um, probably won't be quite as good as someone who's been doing it in the mining industry for 10 or, 15, 10 or 15 years, but there are some guys in the ag that are operating drones that are doing a really good job. I just don't know who they are. Um, counting plants, it's hard to do, um, but there's some algorithms out there that will do it. I don't have a lot to do with irrigated cotton. A lot of people do up in Moree, but some of the people that I deal with that have a lot to do with irrigated cotton say that if they can ca count uh, cotton plants at two leaf stage, it's a, it's a lot of value to them to just decide whether they want to do a replant or not. Um, so their holy grail in buying a drone and using it is to be able to count cotton plants. And the people I know that bought the drone to do that have struggled with it, but they're a consulting company, not a drone technology type company. So they were starting from nothing and then trying to do something which is quite an advanced process. Um, so, and then 3D modelling. This is a uh, lodging trial out of the uh, US, basically taking a lodging score based on how far the, the plant had actually fallen down. This image is quite old, from 2014, I think. I stole it from someone in, when I was over in the US. So um, it's, it's really interesting, and I think that there's a lot of applications for it, but I've, I've sidestepped away from that for the moment to try and... Um, ca uh, use technology that I'm going to get value out for my farm and for the clients that I have at Satama. So the questions that I think need to be asked is, with a lot of the new technology that comes through, is there's a lot of really neat stuff. Uh, we've got to decipher whether it's a solution looking for a problem and where is it adding value. Um, I, often you need to look at your 
problems and then go, what technology do we have to find a solution to that rather than coming around the other way? Um, some people will argue with that. They'll go, okay, we've got this great technology. What problems does it fit to? Um, but yeah, where else can we go for similar data? Uh, who links the technology and the farmers? So that's a big one. Um, it's something that I've been thinking about for a while. Um, you've got your agronomy consultants and they're fantastic. There's a lot of good ones that I work with up in Moree. Uh, but they are absolutely fantastic at crop phenology, at um, soils, at everything to do with the, the plant and the biology and even the chemistry with the chemicals. Chemical chemistry is advanced. If you talk to someone who knows a lot about all the different chemicals we're mixing in our tanks when we make a spray application, you add another job onto them, which is like a computer science type thing. It's starting, it's starting to get very crowded in their head. So um, that's a question that I don't have an answer for. I've got my little niche where I help out uh, people who want to look at satellite imagery on a broad scale and then zoom in on paddocks at a 10 metre resolution. That's what we do with Satamap. And, um, but as far as the, the drone technology goes, um, yeah, there's an open, open space there, I think, uh, for people who want to really master that technology and then offer it, offer it to the farmers. Sentinel-2B, basically at the moment with the 10 metre resolution imagery, it's great for broad acre farming. We get it on a 10 daily cycle today or tomorrow, overnight, I don't know exactly when. They're launching a sister satellite to that, so we'll get it on a five day cycle within six months or so, um, which is really good value because all that data is free. Um, and then as far as the uh, sensors that are mounted on the drones and on the new satellites that are going to orbit, uh, they're always improving and getting better as well. So uh, there's a lot going on in the space, in the drones, but never discredit what's happening in the satellite industry too. The media loves the drones, but I think there's just as much or more happening in the satellite innovation space. If you're interested in, uh, like I've mentioned that a lot of the data is available for free. Um, if you've got a, a bit of a familiarity with using computers and that sort of thing, you can actually go and and learn so much online about it yourself, um, download some satellite data, start playing around with it. There's worldwide rainfall measurements from satellite data every half an hour that not many people know about. So if there's a place that you're interested in knowing how much rain fell and there's no bomb rain gauge there, you can go and look at the satellite. It's, it's a bit of an estimation, um, but it's, it's great data. So that's me for the moment. Um, I know I just went through a whole lot of different types of things, but if you've got any more questions, ask here or um, Come talk to me afterwards. Thank you.